Welcome guys to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host as always, Steve Hall. And today I have Mike Isretel on the podcast again for a QA. and a um, And well, first of all, how's everything going, Mike? Um, seen a lot of photos of you at the moment massing now. The mini cut was a success um, and you're rolling into the 240s. Yep. Hopefully we will be pushing 250-ish in the next six to eight weeks. And... Um, then there's going to be another mini cut and then hopefully we can push to 55 on a mass phase later. I would like to, by the fall slash next early winter, uh, hit 260 with a reasonable body fat level. I think that would be absurd wow. in every measurable respect. And then after that, I uh, will be gearing into a diet to kind of get into looking at some shows. But uh, for now, the plan is to continue to get bigger. Amazing. So that would, would that be competing end of this year? It would be competing um, sometime in next year, 2019. Okay. Awesome. No, that's super exciting. I can't actually, the, the transformation you made and actually, I think, I forget who posted it. Now. Trevor uh, posted it, the transformation that he posted old photos of your first contest prep versus kind of basically what you look like now. And it's kind of like, Wow, uh, the changes different. are insane. <laughs> for sure, for sure. So, um, yeah, looking very much forward to that. And actually, we have some topics in mind, but that's such because you brought up mini cuts. And I know you love talking about mini cuts. And there was a question on mini cuts. And it was essentially kind of um, in terms of we know mini cuts can potentiate massing going forward. Is there a kind of when do you need to think, right, mini cutting no longer is appropriate i should go through a maintenance phase um, before going through a longer cut um is there just a certain number of mini cuts that you can run um is there a time course because obviously part of the maintenance phase is to down regulate kind of volume and resensitize to things as well yeah i think that um you know if you if you don't mess up um put on too much body fat each time and if your mini cut is appropriately long and appropriately hypocaloric enough to burn enough body fat. But realistically, it's not likely that you'll very soon, that is within three or four of these iterations, hit a limit for body composition problems where you have to readjust your body composition by doing a longer cut or, or something like that. So I think you can keep massing and mini cutting in sequence for a while on the sort of body composition front. I think what's going to stop you eventually is that so on a mass phase, we work between minimum effective volume and maximum recoverable volume. On a mini cut, we work right around minimum effective volume. Um, we could hypothetically work around maintenance volume, but um, the thing about a very hypocaloric condition is that what is normally your minimum effective volume on a mass is now your maintenance volume on a mini cut. As a matter of fact, your maintenance volume on a mini cut can be higher than your minimum effective volume on a mass phase because we know as calories drop it, it takes more training to put in enough hypertrophic stimulus to cancel the atrophic stimulus of a very harsh cut which a mini cut certainly is so if we take a look at uh, that from training volume averages what we're really doing is we're all, almost always between a massing phase mev and MRV. And even though the mini cut allows us to drop that quite a bit, um, especially if it's a harsh mini cut, um, it, it could be that, that even with that drop, we're still above MEV almost for sure of a mass phase, even if we're just mini cutting at maintenance volume. And it could be a little bit, just quite a bit above. So your, uh, your minimum effective volume for massing could be 10 sets a week, which is an example. And, uh, you know, your maintenance volume could be eight sets a week, but on a mini cut, your maintenance volume might be 10 sets a week. And your minimum effective volume on a mini cut might be 12 sets a week, or it could be even higher, you know, you know 11 and 13 respectively, or uh, something like that. So after multiple phases like that, like, do you resensitize during your mini cuts? Yes. Is it a complete resensitization? No. So I think it buys you time, but it doesn't buy you infinity time. Um, I think after, I think at most three sequential phases, 
of mass mini cut, mass mini cut, mass mini cut. I think it's time for an actual maintenance phase that lasts anywhere between two to four weeks. My preference is on the longer side of four. And then after that, you can do a little mini cut to sort of get back into shape from the maintenance phase and then start the, the sawtooth pattern again. So I think, uh, you know, and you'll be able to tell that it's not something you have to remember. Okay, Dr. Mike said three. So after three, I'm going to go back. You're going to start to feel um, pretty resistant to volume. And you're not going to get the same pumps you used to. You're not going to get, you know, as sore from the same amount of volume. You'll have to do more volume. You'll have to stretch your joints more. And that's when your joints are going to start to feel it and stuff like that. So it's, um, uh, it's one of the situations where you kind of, uh, you'll know when, you know, you, especially if you've been training a while, you're an intermediate and for sure advanced, you know when you're resistant to volume, you know when it's time to, I mean, you've been there, Steve, it's time for maintenance phase. You basically show up to the gym and you're like, ah, I don't want to be here anymore. <laughs> so, you know, it's time to lower the volume, time to resensitize, or you just doing like 18 working sets for chest and you barely have a pump and you're kind of, instead of getting that like deep doms post training, you get like this frayed all around kind of just joint pain and sort of your muscles just feel tired and you're like, okay, so clearly anabolic response is not what it used to be. Mm -hmm. So I think after about three mini cut mass uh, alterations, well, mind you, that's like, if your mass phases last 10 weeks and your mini cuts last four weeks, it's a long ass time. That's like a year almost. Mm -hmm. But I think so. So basically my argument here is like, um, if you go a year without doing any maintenance phases, it's unlikely that you're approaching things optimally. But as little as once a year, I think, is okay with a maintenance phase, especially if you alternate mass mini cut. And if on the mini cuts, you can still cut your volume pretty low and maintain muscle mass. Mm -hmm. So in terms of, uh, you brought up a good point about the, the fact that when we're dieting, the minimum effective volume is higher than when we're massing. So when you transition from that mass phase to that mini cut, what does that transition look like in terms of programming adjustments, um, like rep ranges? Does anything change there that you're changing to make that mini cut most effective? Yeah. So we have to remember what the purpose of the mini cut is. And the mini cut has two purposes. It's a little bit different than a cut. The number one and pretty much only purpose of a cut is fat loss with muscle retention. A cut doesn't necessarily potentiate you for much, and as we've seen with not just research, but experiences of uh, many individuals and in natural bodybuilding especially, after a deep enough cut, you're not really potentiated for shit, <laughs> except for trying to get your legs back under you, and it takes a month to do that. And you'll grow some muscle in that time, but it's not the best way to go. You know, a six-month cut is not the best way to potentiate for muscle gain, that's for damn sure. So um, mini cutting has that added part of, first of all, you burn fat and keep your muscle. Yes, that's one goal. But the second goal is to potentiate for future massing. Now, one of the potentiations is nutritionally mediated, and that is the reduction of body fat, which works very well. But you also have to think about training mediation. And uh, training mediation means that you basically have to try to do the mini cut while stimulating as little of the hypertrophic pathways as possible um, and doing very little of the kind of training that is most effective for hypertrophy. So one good strategy for a mini cut is to keep the volume as low as you can in order to still eke out um, basically uh, at least a maintenance of a muscle mass. And uh, for intermediates, this can be actually a little bit of muscle growth or something like that, so minimum effective volume. Uh, for advanced, this maintenance is all you're going to get. And at the same time, you want to stay away from higher repetitions, supersets, very high volumes, because your job is to desensitize your musculature and your physiology from exactly those kinds of strategies. You definitely don't want to do like metabolite training or something like that. So it's a good opportunity to do slightly lower uh, reps, definitely fewer sets, but slightly higher intensity. And as soon as you move into mass phase, you're going to reverse that pattern. So basically a mini cut could be an average set number. could be something like eight sets of eight, maybe 10 to 12 total sets per body part per week of eight. -ish. When you move into a mass phase, you may still keep the average sets of eight or just go up a little bit to 10 to 12 average. 
And your first mass phase should be relatively heavy like that. Mm -hmm. No crazy metabolite stuff and just more volume, just more sets, right? That's the biggest, biggest change. And then as you move into your second part of your mass phase, you should in some way, whether it be a distinct mesocycle or during the introduction on top of a normal mesocycle, introduce some higher reps, some drop sets, metabolite type stuff to finish off the mass. And then at the end of that mass, then you transition back into the mini cut. You're going to raise the weight you're lifting, drop the reps and sets. Not that the added weight has any particularly enormous effect. The benefits us is just that we want to step away from the moderate reps uh, and the higher set numbers in order to let the body uh, become less adapted to that stimulus and get more out of it later. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Yeah, we. I mean, we know intensity is one of the biggest drivers for hypertrophy, um, and that kind of ends up you can bring down your volume a little bit and make up for it with that bit of intensity. So, no, that's nice hearing about the transitions because I think that's maybe something not hugely covered before. Uh, maybe you've covered plenty of times in RP plus, uh, but I thought I'd just ask about that. So, no, nice explanation there, Mike. Um, so the next thing I wanted to talk about, unless you wanted to add anything there. No, I'm good. Um, is basically we, we were chatting beforehand um, and Mike is currently working on the RP diet book, um, the second one, which is, I mean, I'm eagerly awaiting it. I'm sure loads of people are eagerly awaiting it. Um, and one of the chapters I don't think maybe is even touched on in the first one. I, I Off the top of my head, I can't remember it being touched on was adherence. Um, and Mike had several kind of levels of adherence. Um, and I really thought this would be valuable for the listeners um, because, I mean, it's something everyone who goes for a diet goes through, whether you're going through contest prep or just going through a mini cut or going through just an extended dieting period for a holiday. Um, so I don't know where you want to start, Mike, if you want to start with kind of, we talked about motivation and then habit forming and how that transition goes along. Sure, sure. So let me see if I can... Uh... Uh, read a passage out of the book. We'll see if Microsoft Word decides that it wants to open things and actually allow them to function. I've been encountering with some Microsoft products lately that they just really want to break and say that we're not working today. Go fuck yourself. Um, all right. So I got it opened up. Let me read a little passage and then I can kind of explain it. So it's your favorite thing, Steve. It's an analogy. So, this is a long fucking book. Jesus. <laughs> uh, okay. So, where are we at? Ooh, okay. So, this uh, section is called From Inspiration to Passion. And basically, so there are five constructs, psychological constructs, that are pertinent to the discussion of what is so colloquially known as motivation. Basically, there are these five constructs, and um, they uh, describe the process of uh, why people and how people adhere to any systematic pursuit, but dieting certainly a very good example. And the five constructs are in order of their appearance and in order of their long-term sustainability, inspiration, motivation, discipline, habit, and passion. Right, and this is covered, Nick and I covered this in an RP video once a really long time ago. We spoke about it for literally five minutes. So these are actually like are pretty uh, easy to define because they're defined pretty well in our normal conversation. Uh, just really quick, inspiration is when you see like an Instagram post of a favorite bodybuilder or something, and you're just like, whoa, look at those arms. Like, fuck, I, I want to look like that, you know? Um, and it hits you, and you just want to do stuff. But we all know that doesn't last very long. It can literally last seconds. It could last minutes. Um, not long. Motivation is that like fire in your belly to do something that lasts for something like 30 minutes to maybe hours, but usually not much longer than that. And I'll get to the analogy in a second, but uh, inspiration looks like a spike in time. Motivation, it doesn't just spike at the beginning of a diet. Usually it comes up. And it's kind of like a wave, like it goes up and down. Like you'll be motivated sometimes and sometimes you won't be. 
Discipline is the use of willpower to stick to a plan knowingly, like you're aware of the fact that you have to use your willpower as a conscious decision. And um, as opposed to just people who genetically just have more willpower, discipline is any person having to use their willpower consciously and they're aware of the fact that it's going to suck, right? Like, I know this sucks, but I got to do it anyway. That's discipline. Discipline um, can be used uh, often, uh, we'll put it this way, can be used throughout and will have to be used throughout a diet, let's say. But discipline is designed to cover the gaps in motivation. So I said, uh, you know, discipline is like, or motivation is like waves. Discipline is going to be something that cancels out when the, when the, when the sort of the, when the boat sinks down in the waves and, you know, hypothetically, you're the boat here. Um, I'm going to have to have some lifting mechanism to keep the boat up, right? And that's uh, discipline. The, the big, huge lesson, and I really, really hope people uh, get to think about this part, uh, discipline is finite, right? Because the willpower that powers it is finite. Now, it's rechargeable. Willpower recharges. But as soon as you start using it, it starts to drain. It's like a health pack in a video game, like a shooting video game. Like after every level maybe after every day or a week in a real life diet, it re-ups, right? But during the level, you get shot by monsters and shit, it goes down, right? So you got to use it diligently. Um, so, you know, people that are like, fuck motivation. It's all about discipline. Like, mm. <laughs> you know, you can only like, you know, if you're, you require discipline to rip your own fingernails off, most people just don't have enough discipline to do that. Um, but if the motivation was to save the entire world, it doesn't really take that much discipline actually to rip your own fingernails off, assuming you want to save the entire world. Most people, and they get famous for it and get laid. Now, now we're talking. <laughs> That's how that works, I assume. Um, so, you know, uh, motivation is great, and we should be doing things that uh, nurture our motivation, but we should also be prepared to use discipline when motivation and inevitably will sometimes be low. Now, the good news is, is that you keep going through these cycles of using motivation and discipline when they are both high and uh, when you adjust them. And what you should also be doing is working on, and a lot of this happens automatically, which is good, but some of it's uh, willingly, is the development of habits. Habits make everything easier because this shit just isn't that hard anymore. Habit basically uh, it turns the situation where you don't have to use your discipline nearly as much. Right? Like if you just go to the fucking gym every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and you've been doing it for months, like people are like, man, like you must be, you see, we get this all the time when you people, you travel or something, you meet new people, like you're so disciplined and you honestly have to think, I guarantee you've done the show. Like, Am I? Yeah. Well, uh, I just kind of do this. Like, I don't know. Like you be, you, don't, you don't tell the 40 year old they're disciplined because they brush their teeth. This is like you brush <laughs> their teeth every day. This is something you do. You're like, man, I, I, I guess I discipline maybe a little Right, but you don't even want to take credit for it because you kind of just don't feel like I'm that disciplined. It's just habit at this point. Better than habit. And not everyone develops this, and that's okay, but you want to get at least everyone to habit, um, is passion. Now, passion is not something that you have much choice um, in developing, but sometimes it grows. And you can foster it in some ways, especially viewing your experience in dieting as a positive one, as a win-win situation, really rewarding yourself psychologically for when you succeed because there's, there's people um, that will get really lean and they'll be like yeah but i shit yet because i'm not an ifbb pro and you're like why can't you admit that you did a good job right because if you never feed your ego you're never gonna feel like you're doing a good job and you're just gonna eventually your habits even aren't gonna push you far enough and you're gonna be like fuck this i hated the sport the entire time i was in it if you feed your passion passion is ridiculous because it makes all of this stuff it, 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 you know, kind of a, there's, you don't even need to use discipline hardly at all. I mean, you know, do you have to use discipline? Like, let's say you're passionate about, you know, making sweet love to your significant other. That's real passion, right? Do you have to use your discipline to make yourself make love to your, that's nonsense. You probably have to use your discipline to not do it in public that like offends other people <laughs> the other way around. Right. So like, we'll talk about someone like, you know, Jared Feather truly has a passion for bodybuilding training. We have to like tie Jared Feather to a chair to make sure he doesn't train in his off days. That's how bad it is. Can you imagine just telling a regular person like this person is so passionate about training, they want to train. It's not like they have discipline. They actually want to train. So like, you know, I meet people on uh, you're know, flying across the country around the world. I sit next to someone on a plane and they're like, you know, they find out what I do and we talk and they're like, you must be so disciplined. 
I actually tell them, I'm like, you know, funny enough, it, it doesn't require much discipline. I legitimately want to do that. And they're like, you want to eat that protein bar right there? I'm like, yes. They're like, really? I'm like, yes, I love it. I feel like a machine that's on a purpose. I love everything about it. And they're like, damn. And you're like, yeah, isn't that great? So, I mean, when people say like, what are the likely, what's the chance that you're going to be involved in the fitness, uh, you know, for the next five years? I'm like, I'm going to be involved in fitness the rest of my life because to not be involved in fitness is a really bad thing. Mm -hmm. So um, I think all of these constructs have their place and we have to make sure that as coaches, we guide our clients um, from one to another and make sure they see the big picture of when to use what, when to rely on what. So like if you're on the shitter and you're trying to scroll through Instagram to find inspiring quotes because you don't want to work out, it's fine to know that, that you find an inspirational quote, it might spike for you. But you also have to know that's not sustainable. And then in the interim, you're going to have to use some fucking discipline to go to the gym anyway. So there's idea that everything should be like, you know, because you see these dumbass Instagram quotes, like you don't have to have discipline when you have passion. It's like fundamentally true, but people are like, I should be passionate about this. Why are we using my discipline? It's like, because passion takes a long time to develop and you may not even ever develop it. So why don't we use your discipline when you have to, but keep your motivation high, work on your habits, and then eventually we'll get to passion, Right. One, one trippy thing that you see, especially with sort of Instagram motivational quotes, is people who have been uh, training for a week talking about passion. Motherfucker, oh, you do not have passion after training for a week. You have inspiration, right? There's a very big difference, right? Um, it's kind of like the difference between, uh, you know, first date puppy love and like marriage for 15 years. Like first date puppy love, you're really excited, but someone's like, you're going to die for that person? They're like, <laughs> wait, what? Uh, no, wait, why do we have to die? Why are people dying? What's going on? But if someone had 15 years of marriage, will you die for your wife? You'd be like, where do I sign up? You're like, holy shit, that's a whole different type of commitment. But that grows. You know, you just don't start dying for people on day, first date, hopefully. And if you are, damn it, you need some fucking dating. <laughs> um, so let me uh, see if I can read this uh, analogy, little paragraph I've put together. And this will hopefully look similar when the book comes out. Um, that it's kind of tying all these things together. All right. So uh, here it is. In total, the role of the five adherence constructs is to buttress your willpower, your inspiration, motivation, and discipline, or reduce the need for as much of it as usually needed to create adherence through habit and passion. Think of a boat that's parked next to a dock that is way too high from people from the boat to climb out onto. If you think of people climbing out as accomplished goals, adherence, think of inspiration and motivation as the water level. By raising the water level, we can lift the boat up higher and get people uh, to reach the dock by simply extending their hands, or simply just walking right off onto the dock. Inspiration is like a wave. It can lift the boat high, but just for a short time. But just like waves bring in the tides, inspiration can bring in motivation. With a high tide and high motivation, the boat lifts. Of course, the tide waxes and wanes. We might rely on a powered mini ramp on the boat, discipline, to lift our passengers up a bit higher so they can still reach the dock at lower tides of motivation. But the ramp is powered by the engines of the boat and by great energetic expense that we can't always rely on due to the limits of fuel and engine power. As habit grows over time, the ladder lengthens. The longer the ladder, the more likely that people can reach it and climb out onto the dock. If the ladder is long and used often, so many passengers are delivered so regularly and successfully, goals met, that the dock might install an escalator instead of the ladder, symbolizing the construct of passion and making the offloading of passengers nearly effortless. Even without the need for the escalator of passion, if the ladder is long, well entrenched habits for dieting, if the water level is high, inspiration and motivation are strong, and the ramp of discipline is used in sequence with the tide of motivation properly, then offloading passengers, dieting with high adherence, is as easy as walking off of the boat. Wow. That is, uh, that's an insane, like the amount of things you brought into that analogy. Overkill. Made, like, <laughs> I want to clap. No, well, over. I mean, for, it makes complete sense when people have to read it over a few times, but for sure. it's, for sure. that's really like, that's powerful. That makes a lot of sense. For sure. So, and, and I think the analogy helps us really think about like, you know, if inspiration is seen as a wave and people talk about like, Diet success, it's all about being inspired. You're like, 
man, do cruise ships offload their passengers entirely through waiting for waves and being like, oh, <laughs> go, wait, hold on, don't go, <laughs> and fall through. You're like, no, clearly that's not the case, right? But then again, you know, are they going to come in at a low tide and just use their uh, like ramps and burn a shitload of fuel and cost themselves a lot of money, discipline, right? Uh, no, they're going to try to come in at a high tide to offload passengers. And, you know, when there's a low tide, they might use the ramp, but they're not just going to like, use it all the time for no fucking reason. They're going to try to time it with a high tide. Um, and then of course, like if a cruise ship, you know, like shows up to a real good port like Miami or something that has a lot of cruises, there's going to be ladders. There's going to be escalators. But if you show up to some shitty port, it's just going to be fucking ground or whatever. And you're like, well, fuck do we get on there? You know, it's going to be tough. So it's one of these things where all of this sort of boat analogy is kind of ridiculous and clunky. But I think if you read it enough and you internalize it, you kind of realize that, you know, all of these constructs play a role. We just have to know how limited their role is mm -hmm. and how powerful and when powerful the role is so that we can adjust ourselves to, first of all, have realistic expectations and second of all, do our best. Right. So, so a realistic expectation is that in the first week of a diet, you should be fucking pumped. You should be inspired and motivated. If you're not, something is wrong. Then the reasons for doing the diet just clearly aren't worth it. So if you're not motivated in the first week of the diet, you're going to be fucked for sure. Right. But if it's weeks two, three, four, and you're still trying to rely on inspiration and motivation, you're not doing a good enough job of reminding yourself that you have to be disciplined, right? And you know this very well, Steve. You're working with clients a long time. How many times after week one or two do you have to give the discipline talk? Because like, yeah, week one or two, they're like, oh, I want to eat cheeseburgers. And you're like, we don't eat cheeseburgers because we made a fucking commitment. But you can also say to your clients, now here's the deal. We need to use discipline. And here's the deal. New clients, man. They know that motivation and inspiration have kind of started waning a little bit, and they know that motivation comes and goes. They're like, Jesus, am I really going to have to keep cranking discipline like this every now and again for, for forever? Yeah. And does this ever get easier? And the answer is, of course, it gets easier. Habits are unbelievably powerful. And you don't even, I don't even tell people about passions because that's some shit you can discover for yourself. You know, I don't like promising passion. Um, but habits for sure. And, and again, it's one of those things where if you expect habits to be something that you can rely on within the first week, you're fucking dead wrong. It's just not, you don't build habits that fast. So it's one of these things where there's a sequence now. Get your clients inspired, help them with motivation, then prep them to be ready to exert their discipline. And all the while when they're exerting discipline through the mid range of the diet, you help them build good habits. And as their habits come online, if you succeed through all those stages, shit's pretty good. But if you fuck up at any one point, it's a bad deal. So for habits, for example, how do you make habits better? Well, meal prep is like probably one of the perfect examples of that, right? Meal prep is the ultimate habit that makes dieting 50 fucking times easier. Like if, if you've got a client that's dieting and you never told them about meal prep, they're like, yeah, I've got to run out of the office and meetings to catch like, you know, burrito and make it all custom and healthy. You're just like... Sweet. Good job. Use discipline. <laughs> like, they're going to run out of that shit sooner or later. So a good coach helps their clients build habits, uh, but also reminds them that discipline is something that needs to be used. And there are some uh, coaches that are so nice and um, so sort of, for lack of a better word, kindergarten teachery, you know, like all butterflies and hippie shit, that they don't ever really come down on their clients and say, look, you're going to have to grow a fucking pair of nuts slash ovaries uh, to do some shit. You know, you can't just... It's not always going to be easy, but it, but that has to be paired with the construction of habit. So no, um, I, I absolutely love it. Make sense of it. I think, um, as a, as a coach, um, and as some, well, I coach other people through this and obviously do it myself, I can relate to it so, uh, so much. And I think even just hearing you now has made me think of when I do have clients and we are going through and they haven't got the habits yet, it's made me realize that these are things I have and they will develop them and we are going through something that will develop them and it's kind of like oh i can actually kind of tell them that we will get there and it's tough yes. for a reason now so i like that element um and i also like the fact you touched on um i think from my angle i get a lot of people coming in who want to do like that flexible dieting approach and they or people view flexible dieting as something that's easy um, and the amount of people that think it's easy and then realize oh no it's not because yes it's flexible but within a constraint um, otherwise it won't produce results and then they see no results because they end up kind of they have no plan. They don't do their meal prep. Flex it out, baby. <laughs> exactly. Uh, they go to McDonald's, blow all their fat macros, and then they're like, oh, now I can just drink protein shakes, and that is <laughs> yeah. too much discipline that no one can provide. <laughs> exactly. 
Exactly. So it's all about um, just using this, these constructs, knowing when they arise, knowing when they're most useful, um, and knowing when they're not most useful, and uh, uh, using your discipline and basically doping out your willpower accordingly because you kind of know what's coming. You know, it's it's similar to like um, just like a shoot 'em up video game where you, if you've played it enough times, you know not to use your grenades on the small demons because you know you're going to need them for the final boss, right? But uh, you know, the Instagram motivation culture is the video game equivalent of sh- like blasting a bunch of nuclear missiles at like the first demon you see and being like success. And you're like, uh, hold on, <laughs> that might not be a good idea. <laughs> right. So, you know, like people will say like, you know, the number one key to success is to constantly stay inspired. Like nobody's constantly inspired. If you're constantly inspired, you're on MDMA <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to die if you're constantly on MDMA. I don't know what to tell you. Can you imagine walking around the world just being like, ah, <laughs> just permanent religious experience? It's not going to work. Um, and a lot of people, you know, in their coaching profiles, you know, uh, I think are fucking ridiculous. I don't want to get on that rant, but, um, you know, um, I'm, my goal is to inspire people. Like, yeah, inspiration is cheap as fuck. Mm-hmm. And uh, most people have been inspired before. It's also not that hard. You know, you show people a fucking Lance Armstrong documentary and they're inspired as shit. The question is, how does that translate in their uh, sequence of discipline yeah. paired with a logical approach that eventually forms habits? That's how you get people. Once, once habits form, it's easy street. You know, inspiration is not even the hard part. You know what I mean? It's um, it, it's kind of like uh, you know, it's it's kind of like someone who's a who's a master chef. Their passion is to get people the right cookware. They're like, if you just get people the right cookware, everything is great. You're like, yeah, I don't think that teaches people how to cook at all, man. Uh, you can have the right cookware and be like, let's do it, and look up recipes that are too long. You don't understand what any words mean. You're like, fuck that. So it's kind of like putting all your marbles in something that is, uh, again, emotionally very cool to talk about. Inspiration feels amazing. You want to inspire people because it feels cool. You know what I mean? Um, and uh, But habit and discipline is where it's at. I don't, I don't, it's funny. It's like a philosophical side note. Um, I never really not trusted. I was never very comfortable with uh, um, happily ever after type of scenarios and movies. Not from a romantic perspective, but like, like the war against the zombies has been won, and now it's time to rebuild, and the movie ends. And I'm like, yeah, rebuilding is much harder than winning a war against zombies. I'm just not, can't finish this movie on a happy note and be like, ah, everything's going to be fine. Like, I don't know about that. I, I also like, um, I really don't like uh, the feeling I get when I wax too motivational at like a seminar and people come out being like, wow, I'm so pumped. I just want to be like, that was fun, right? We had a lot of fun together. I'm like, totally, like, it was funny. It was great. It felt good. Yeah, but like, I just want to be like, don't, don't put too much stock in this shit. The, the real question is, do you go home and execute habits, yeah. right? Uh, I can tell you, I can inspire, like, I have a gift for talking a bunch of shit and inspiring people, but like, I just don't think inspiration is that valuable. You know what I mean? Because uh, again, the spikes come and go. The question is, do you insert your discipline when needed, manage your motivation properly? And develop habits so mm-hmm. that's all stuff that if coaches know their clients don't have to make these mistakes but unfortunately a lot of coaches make them already so the clients say, oh, fuck, no. be like we're just going to keep you inspired baby get you motivated shut the fuck up anyway yeah i can i can see it completely it, it relays into so many aspects kind of that the inspiration like you'll read a business book and you'll be like yeah i'm inspired and then you don't actually put any of it into practice and so you don't see the business growth you wanted it, sure. it happens with loads of things or people are like, oh, uh, I don't know, maybe I, I was inspired to get on a certain podcast guest, emailed them and then never followed it up because it lost. Like I just couldn't be disciplined totally. and do it. Totally. Um, so, Discipline no. is when you write down in your to-do list, message the following people over the several weeks to get them on my podcast. That's discipline. And once you've done that enough, you just habitually do the right things to make yep. your podcast a good business. And then it's easy. And then you get all the kind of success that you want. But there's no like, it, it's funny, but like people ask me like, what inspires you to write books? I'm like, I don't know. I, that inspiration was years ago. I just made a list of books I have to write and I'm just working through it. Now it's habit for me to write. So I just write all the time. And this is, that's it. Like, I'm not, you know, but the, again, people look for inspiration because it feels good to even vicariously have inspiration. And, um, you know, like uh, motivational speakers are good and well. I, I just don't know how much value hmm. all that stuff. 
some, but we got to put it in context. Yeah, completely. And actually, now you've brought this book up, I do want to ask one more question about it. And I don't know, it might be too much to go into, but what are the, uh, in addition to this chapter, what other elements maybe are being further developed or changed? Are there any additions um, that you might want to just kind of briefly go over? Because obviously they're going to be covered in depth. Let me read you the sections. So chapter one, the Daya priorities, uh, you know, like uh, ranking everything to do the most important stuff when we need to. Number two, calorie balance. Chapter three, macronutrients. Chapter three is fucking enormous. Hold on, let me scroll through this. Uh, it's like 50 pages, predictably. Uh, and then chapter four is, should be um, nutrient timing. Chapter five is, fuck, nutrient timing is huge, by the way. Oh, Not wow. because it's important, but because there's all kinds of intricacies. Yeah. Um, we really beat it to death. Um, it should be a pretty cool read. Chapter five is food composition, like where you get your fats, proteins, and carbs from. Talks about the glycemic index, stuff like that. Chapter six is, I think, supplements. Yep, supplements and hydration, which is nice and short because that stuff is, is not much to it. Um, and then, oh, and a food composition covers micronutrients too. Um, chapter seven is diet adherence. Uh, and that's a meaty chapter. It's completely new. The old book did not have a diet adherence chapter. Chapter eight is... Come on. There we go. That's me scrolling, by the way, is how long this book is. Um, chapter eight is hunger management, um, which I am currently working on that chapter. Uh, we got satiety index rankings, all kinds of cool stuff. Chapter nine, nutritional periodization, right? How to sequence fat loss and muscle gain phases and all that stuff. Chapter 10, designing your own diet. So, you know, like we've had that in the original book. It's, you know, how to pick all your macros and calories. Kind of an example, mm -hmm. right? Um, choosing your phase lengths, all this other stuff. Chapter 11, monitoring your progress. So it's, you know, skin folds, weigh-ins, how often, how to do it, how to put it in context. Chapter 12, body image and self-worth. Ooh, that's nice. a new one. Uh, yeah, yeah, because we want to make sure that when people pick up a diet book, they are dieting for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. We talk about a lot of stuff like that. Um, and chapter 13, special diet circumstances, which is going to be an enormous chapter that mostly I don't write because we have other experts writing that. A quick list of topics, vegan, vegetarian diets, dieting during conception, dieting during pregnancy, dieting, post delivery dieting for young athletes, diets and menopause, dieting with select health issues. Uh, diets and the elderly, food sensitivities and allergies, and gut microbiota. Oh, we have a uh, Gabrielle Fundaro is our resident RP expert on gut microbes. She actually did her PhD in gut microbiota, so she's going to be refuting a lot of the myths of, you know, everything down comes down to gut microbes. Which, by the way, I don't know if you knew this, but oh no, no, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, gut microbes are so 2017. <laughs> it's autophagy now. Uh, autophagy oh, yeah. is, is, uh, is the, that's it. It's all about autophagy. Got microbes don't care anymore. Um, as long as you're starving, you're good to go. Um, chapter 14, competition dieting, which is split into dieting strategies for endurance athletes, competition peak and, uh, day of uh, nutrition, water cutting for various events. And then last is chapter 15 which is going to be fucking enormous because it is fads and fallacies in body composition and performance oh, yeah. dieting. And I can actually ramble off uh, at least some of the topics that we have. This will be really funny. Let's see how fast I can talk. Uh, alcohol and dieting. Eating at night makes you fat? Question mark. Breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Naturalistic fallacy. No chemicals fallacy. GMO, organic, artificial sweeteners. Hormone contamination and mimicry. Soy meat and dairy products. Antibiotics and food, cleanses and detoxes, juicing as a special effective tool, um, must be vegan, must eat meat, both fallacies, by the way, uh, uh, excessive protein, carbs are the devil, fats are the devil, <laughs> so we have all three macros as the devil, of course, um, intermittent fasting as a religion, high meal number as a religion, test boosters, nutrient partitioning agents, SARMs as of 2017 market, which, by the way, I don't know if you know this, but they're almost all fake. 
Um, they did a study recently where they found it all, but one was fake. That was sweet. Um, quote, that hot new supplement, which is a fallacy in and of itself. Anti-grain, anti-dairy, gluten, anti-processed food, IFYM Pop-Tart diet, which has been beaten to yeah. death, but people apparently still do. Radical clean eating, intuitive eating. Uh, lifestyle changes should be emphasized and the word dieting should be eliminated is a fallacy. Massive rates of weight loss for motivation for fattest people, quote unquote, empty calories, which by the way is a fucking hmm. completely retarded thing to say. It makes no sense. Um, I've actually literally uh, heard people say in conversation, it's okay to drink Coke because it's empty calories. And I'm like, no, 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 they're, they're not empty. They're empty. The, the empty calories is like a micronutrient thing, <laughs> yeah. you know? And also like, the, like some nutritionists assume that the only reason you eat food is micronutrients. Like, well, okay, they don't have vitamins and minerals, but if you eat a well-balanced diet, you can have a, the fucking Coca-Cola. You don't have every food doesn't have to bring you like a, a fucking cornucopia of vitamins and minerals from the fucking Amazon rainforest, um, which would be sweet. That's the only way I ate, Steve. I literally eat out of cornucopias. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, ooh, here's a good one: uh, calories don't matter, hormones do. <laughs> oh yeah, fallacy. Blood type dieting, genetic type dieting, as of 2017. BCAA magic, alkaline acidic diets. Dirty bulking versus clean bulking, bulletproof coffee, the real scoop on grass-fed uh, animals, local eating, quote-unquote, eat fat to burn fat, coconut oil, inflammation, dietary cholesterol versus serum cholesterol and eggs, carb backloading, superfoods, single food diets, so like grapefruit diet, cabbage soup, oh, yeah. um, negative calorie foods. Uh, what cravings mean, um, and, and what I mean by that is uh, cravings can mean deficiencies, but should not be overly trusted because, you know, you'll, I'm sure you'll have clients be like, I really felt like I needed to eat a cheeseburger as my body was telling me, like, well, <laughs> yeah. what the fuck, your body tells you you need to weigh 200 kilos. I don't think you should listen to that. Um, so uh, lastly, it's eating more to lose weight, under eating is the cause of weight gain, uh, same topic, exogenous ketones, <laughs> digestion problems as causes of weight gain, which is completely insane. It's backwards. Um, and then, um, ooh, yeah, here's a good one. We just inserted, and we'll probably add a couple more as we go through. Uh, a, a very interesting fallacy, very common, is dieting with the goal of coming off all drugs. So I've heard people say, for example, like um, individuals who are pre-diabetic or diabetic and they use metformin. They'll say uh, literally like, oh, I want to diet or I've dieted and now I'm getting ready to come off all my drugs because I don't need them anymore. It's like metformin is a life extension drug. It literally makes laboratory animals live longer. It has basically no negative effects uh, unless you discover them very soon and you very much will like uh, ketoacidosis and things like that. If you don't have them, you, you're just not at risk for them. And uh, it's just going to make shit better and it's going to make sure that you don't regress um, same thing with blood pressure medications. Blood pressure medications, like lisinopril, for example, the lower your blood pressure to a point, and that point is very low, the healthier you are, um, and this is like chronic lifetime health, literally the, the less degraded your organs become from being physically pressed yep. on by high blood pressure. So when some people, when they get you know, right below the really bad threshold, like their blood pressure goes to like 135 over 80 or something, which is still pre-hypertensive, but not just uh, super scary. They're like, great, I can come off my blood pressure drugs now. The next question is like, why do you want to come off those drugs so bad? Well, because they're like poison. Like, they're not really poison. They have like almost no side effects. And people have been taking lisinopril for fucking generations. It's, it's got no downside. Take it. You need it. And it, clearly, you know, we're not pushing drugs to people who just don't need it, but it's always those borderline cases who like just finished their first diet, just had their first blood work with good numbers, not great numbers, good numbers. And they're great. I'm going to come off all drugs. Like, why don't you give it five years of staying on the drugs? And if you're way under the requisite numbers, you can start to come off them. You know what I mean? When people just um, have this idea that the just drugs are so toxic, you know, what's toxic is being fucking over fat, having high blood pressure. That shit will kill you real fucking fast. Being on fucking the medication for blood pressure is way better than having high blood pressure. If you have to err on any one side, if you're right in the middle, err on the side of being on the drugs, not on the side of having blood pressure. You know, people will be like, oh, my blood pressure is sometimes high, but um, I don't think it's a big enough problem, so I don't take the drugs. It's like you have it literally just backwards, backwards logic. 
that anyway. book sounds i can see why it took you so long to scroll because and i didn't expect so many fallacies to be in there i was like oh these are nice to you <laughs> i was like you know what's how, how funny I, I i made a list of i think we have like 30 or so i made a list of about 20 and i posted it on facebook i don't know if you remember this like uh six months ago yeah i was like hey folks can you add to these and people like as usual pleasantly surprised me on social media they were like oh yeah and they started listing shit i was like oh my god why didn't i think of that and i was like oh some of them are depressing i'm like god this is still a fallacy that's right yeah you know and some of them you just read correspondence between people read youtube comments read instagram posts and you're like oh shit i forgot about that like the um trying to get off of all drugs like i think that was from a youtube comment and it just reminded me it just reminded me of the fact that i have heard that from like my parents and all their friends like oh i'm gonna diet so i can get off all these drugs it's like that shouldn't be your number one goal in dieting. Your number one goal in dieting should be have good blood work <laughs> and good health. You can worry about the drugs later, but it's like that's really their goal. So, And actually, I don't know if I've, I've got a fallacy that might be added or maybe it wouldn't be. Um, it was funny. I was hey, talking Steve. to a client today and uh, we we're talking about hydration and how um, hunger can be mistaken for thirst or the other way around. Thirst can be mistaken for hunger. So staying hydrated is a good idea because you might end up eat, overeating because of it. Um, and I was like, actually, I've just heard this repeated over and over again. I've never actually researched it much. And then looking into it, didn't look like there was actually a lot of research to back it. So I didn't know if this is something you have heard before or have any comments on. Steve, you're a brilliant man. Uh, I just inserted two more fallacies into the book based on that. Yes. Uh, fallacy one is thirst mistaken for hunger. Fallacy two is hyperhydration as religion because they're often linked. It's the hyperhydration people that often peddle the shit where they're like, you have to drink water at all times. Um, and it's just like, why? Well, yeah, if you're hydrated, fine. If you get more than hydrated, you literally have no more benefits and you could have costs actually. Um, so you're absolutely right on the money. I will tell you that the thirst for hunger thing, I have not seen any research on that directly. I find it a very, very, very highly um, I'm skeptical of that. Here's where there is some validity, and we just talked about this in the anti-hunger strategies in the book. Um, if you drink lots of water before a meal, not chronically, just before a meal, like you take um, you know, a liter of water down the hatch, it stretches your stomach, and once you start eating the meal, it stretches it even more, and it gives you more fullness for the meal than you would expect with the calories normally. So eating, drinking water before a meal is a good strategy to limit how much you're going to eat. And if you've already prearranged how much you're going to eat, it um, makes you feel fuller for longer, uh, gives you more satisfaction with the meal so that you can be more adherent to your diet. That is a very different claim than when you are dehydrated, that your body signals hunger. Um, it actually just doesn't do that at all. It signals thirst. As a matter of fact, um, if you're thirsty, there's a very good chance that because that drive is so powerful, you're not actually going to be hungry, even though you, um, physiologically should be. So for example, like after I do jujitsu, um, if I don't have my water bottle handy or if just, I just did back to back rolls when I'm super thirsty and someone's like, Hey, cheeseburger. I'm like, get that shit the fuck yeah. out of my face. I want fucking water. Now, once I get water, literally 30 seconds later, I'm like, ooh, I could eat, <laughs> right? So it's backwards, totally backwards logic. Um, and people say, like, that, see, that should drive me up the wall. I mean, that's why we have a fancy and fallacies thing. It's primarily shit pisses me off. But, uh, <laughs> but, but honestly, it, it, it's one of these things. Um, I almost wish we had a fallacy of clever shit people say that's supposed to be con common wisdom. You know, I'm going to try to thread that in the book, um, just in parentheses. Clever, clever sounding shit people say to pass off as uncommon wisdom, uh, re dieting. So, like, uh, that's just a thing. You know, everyone always wants to fucking zing you with shit, you know, yeah. like, oh, did you know that alligators are only have like 13 teeth and most people shut up? That's <laughs> probably wrong. Like there's all kinds of shit that people say all the time. That's just, just probably wrong. Yeah. Um, and the, the, you know, the, the delusion of crowds uh, and the sort of, uh, madness of crowds and the delusion of mass numbers of people has been documented through, through a 
a lot of stuff and all these little quirky things, and especially in the diet sphere, especially in the more naturalistic part. I mean, Jesus, you know, like, you, you know, put put a couple lemon slices in your water and you'll reduce hunger. I'm like, <laughs> lemon? I actually, Steve, this is a fucked up thing. I actually use lemon slices in my water when I'm eating all you can eat sushi because the acidity of the lemons helped me smash more sushi. <laughs> Like this backwards advice, <laughs> like drinking acidic things makes me hungrier. <laughs> so it, it's one of these things where it's like people just love to be that person that has a little zinger. Like, mm-hmm. did you know that as soon as someone's like, did you, well, I heard I might just, I just fucking save it. Um, you know, nobody likes the boring tried and true shit. They always want that zinger. bullshit. No, I think this is why supplements are just like people just reach out to supplements because it's like oh there's a study that says this and it's like you yep. almost find a study to claim anything um under the right kind of circumstances so yep. that hot new supplement everyone wants it and i i mean you just made a really good point about the the hunger and thirst thing is the we know we survive longer without food than without like hydration so why would it if anything it would be the other way around 100 percent. we'd 100 percent. yeah so, um, no, I'm glad you kind of brought that one out and when, yeah, cause I was saying it to a client and literally I was catching myself saying it, thinking this sounds wrong. Um, and, uh, yeah, she, yeah, we had a good discussion. We had a search and yeah, couldn't find anything on it. So I'm glad that was one. Um, I think we've probably taken, well, we've covered a lot of the book, um, and we've taken enough of your time. I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add, uh, Mike, let's do one more. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I didn't know if you wanted to, it might be too big a topic to cover. We spoke about it before off air was this kind of, I think you made a statement recently about, um, kind of volume and kind of, it's better to start lower rather than higher. Um, and I was talking and a lot of people have been talking about kind of people are doing too much volume. They're getting, doing just junk volume. They're not going hard enough. And there was a recent study. I know mass uh, reviewed it about people kind of underrating their RPE. So people just going too easy. And I didn't know if you wanted to kind of talk to the subject at all. And um, I know kind of some people have gone through methods of using kind of top sets where they kind of almost hit failure and then do drop sets um, and kind of the implications of that. Sure. Do you know, um, I haven't seen the study, unfortunately, was it on, uh, untrained males or recreationally trained or were these uh, higher level athletes? Off the top, I actually don't know off the top of my head. I feel like they, cause of the recommend, I feel like they were trained. Um, but I'm not completely sure. Yeah. So and Eric Helms actually made a, I think it was Eric Helms. Yeah. That made, um, a very interesting point about the nature of failure in an experimental condition versus the nature of failure in a gym condition. And I've been involved in many research studies myself um, as both a subject and uh, an experimenter. And we literally, there's four researchers yelling at you and and you're spotted on all sides in a proper study. You will hit concentric failure and you will use all of your fucking willpower to do so. Um, So a lot of times when people say taken to failure um, in good studies, that means, you know, true concentric failure with maximum motivation. That is way, way, way more stimulative and way more fatiguing than what normal people would just sort of give up at. But I will say this. um, In the biggest problem for going to true failure usually is with beginners and not with intermediate and advanced. From my experience and my reading of the literature, beginners usually just don't know what the fuck failure is. And it shit starts hurting and they're like, ah, fuck this. Like, yeah, I failed. And you're like, no, you didn't. But intermediates and advanced, like, yeah, when they fail, they fail. The good news is beginners don't have to go even RIR for to get great gains. And they probably shouldn't because they just get hurt and their technique will break down. So it's a little bit of a self-solving problem. Like, it's bad that beginners can't reach close to failure. But, they, but it's good because they actually don't need to. It's a good thing. It's not as big of a problem with intermediate as advanced, in, in my view. And here's another thing. So from a hypertrophy perspective, um, if you are RAR4 or higher, just doing more sets can overcome uh, failure proximity problems. If you really never go any more than three RAR or any less, right? So you're never pushing it harder than three RAR. Just by doing more sets, you'll eventually get the same hypertrophy anyway. 
Will it be as efficient time-wise? No. Will it be as effective? Uh, unless you're hyper-advanced and you really need that superlative stimulus, uh, probably will be very, very much as effective. In strength training, so long as you're lifting sufficiently heavy loads, proximity to failure is sort of irrelevant. Again, you could just do more sets of submaximal. And a, and a lot of strength training in practice, we have to keep people away from going closer to failure more than we have to get people to go to failure. So when, when the studies like this come out and say people are really underestimating their reps in reserve, it's actually really good news, I think, for most situations. Not all. Most people shouldn't be going to failure nearly as much as they think. Um, and, and I'm actually like, you know, when I report my RIRs, especially on Instagram or Facebook, but people will, will say like, hey, Dr. Mike, what was that set? And I'll be like, yeah, it was like RIR1. And I've had some people be like, you know, it didn't look like RIR1. And I have to tell them like, okay, so if there's a gun to my head, I probably could have cranked out another three reps. But that kind of effort would be so superlative for me. It would bring me so close to the likelihood of injury. that it, and it would increase my chance of being technically erroneous so much that it was just not worth it at all. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, failure for me means good technique under normal motivational circumstances. Uh, so, sort of like, um, you know, the uh, high-frequency squatting daily max. The daily max isn't your fucking grinder who balls to all max. It's like, you just like, shut it down. Now, I think that training failure means to be a little more higher intensity than a daily max type of thing, but it, it can't be balls-to-the-wall psychosis every time. Um, if it was that, if everyone really did train that hard, I think RAR 5 and 6 would produce good gains too. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I think real-world RAR 3 and 4 um, produce great gains, but if you were talking about RAR and true failure in a lab, I think RAR 5 and 6 would, with enough sets would produce really good hypertrophy, conserving good technique, and probably not risking injury nearly as much. Um, so I, I, I don't see this as a really big problem. Um, mm -hmm. um, I think that, uh, there is a school of thought, um, not school of thought, uh, kind of a tendency with like Ian McCarthy, for example, and, uh, his, his merry band of pirates, um, to really, uh, err on the side of easier, low RER, low volume. I think it's a fine approach. I think it's a clearly Ian and I are in communication, but I, I believe it has limitations. He thinks my more extremist approach has limitations. I think Eric Helms is somewhere in the middle or something like that. I think I'm in the middle too nowadays. But um, yeah, there are people like in, in McCarthy School that you may level that critique at them that they don't come close enough to failure, that they should be training harder. Uh, and it may have some value, some, some value, not total, not, not sort of totalistic value, but some value. But, but, but those people in the vast minority, like you go to regular gyms, you know, Steve, you train in regular gyms all the time. There's some fucking some fucking bloke, some fucking cunt, like just crushing himself on multiple sets of bench and his buddy's pulling it off his dumb ass. Yeah. Like it's going to failure is not his problem. His problem is going to failure, <laughs> uh, not, not going to failure. So um, I think for most individuals, this uh, sort of uh, a hypothetical push of, well, we need to be training harder um, is a push in the wrong direction. For some mm -hmm. individuals, I think it's very pointed. Like some people be like, oh, I hit failure. And you're like, oh, you fucking did but I think those individuals, the most I'm willing to grant is like it's one third those people and two thirds people that go too far. Uh, it's definitely not like half and half. I don't think. What do you think? Do you think it's really half and half a problem? Or? No, it's really good that you brought it up because I've had discussions with other people and I've I've seen discussions online as well. And for the majority of my clients, it's when we start out our mesocycle at three reps in reserve it's they have to hold themselves back and the like when we first started like that they overshot and they kept overshooting they're like i need to stop doing that and it's very rare for me to get clients where in their final week they're absolutely like they they were landing within an eight to ten rep range at three and two reps in a reserve and then they start getting like 20 that's yes. happened maybe once or twice but the vast yes. majority of people who are used to training hard um and it's only maybe when i had one-on-one -on -one pt clients who were very new who then they, they didn't seem to like they couldn't train that hard but then like you said that's not the problem no no 
Um, so, so those are my thoughts on the matter. Did you want me to give a more expansive thought on it? Though, though you mentioned like the feeder set or something like that. Yeah, it's actually very interesting because I think we touched on it when you um, kind of went over the critiques of MRV, and that was kind of people are talking about doing intense sets and like reducing junk volume, and then you don't have to, you get more productive work in the gym, and it's less likely to get you injured because you, you're not doing as many sets, and you've already kind of I think we covered that pretty well in that it's not the volume normally that's causing the problem. It's that proximity to failure and that higher weight that could potentially cause that problem. I can't be more emphatically in support of what you just said. I have never seen anyone, including myself, with a 275 pound squat for 10 RM get hurt doing 225 pounds for their fifth set of 10 or their sixth set of 10. Like if they're doing perfect technique up and down, easy reps, but they're just doing a lot of sets. I've literally never seen anyone get hurt like that. When you see a guy doing 265 for a grinder 12 rounding his back, you're like, that motherfucker is going to die soon. And it, uh, you just watch and be like, yeah, here we go. And, and yep, and he's hurt, right? That's the shit that gets you hurt. The, um, uh, if you compare uh, injury rates and the kind of injury rates that you tend to see, with bodybuilding training versus powerlifting training, man, you know, every powerlifter will tell you everything higher than a 5RM is a fucking gamble, especially if they're strong. You may just very well get hurt on the next rep. So if you have any issues about getting hurt, you better not have them when you're a powerlifter. You just literally need to clear your head and do what it takes because you just can't can get hurt. But if you're doing like sets of 15 on dumbbell press, you're just not realistically ever worried about injury. You're just not, right? So... And, it, and especially if the, like, I've, like, Steve, how many times have you ever seen someone get hurt on an RIR 5 or RIR 4? I've literally never seen it unless mm -hmm. that quad was just ready to come off. Yeah. But when the people start grinding, that's when you start looking over and being like, here we go. Here's yeah. what's going to happen. So when people say, like, oh, you're going to get injured less by pushing it harder in a shorter time span versus spreading out your work into more sets and getting less close to failure, I, I, I I mean, unless you exceed your MRV by doing way too many sets, yeah, chronically you'll get hurt more. But but uh, if you are still within your MRV and you just do more sets but at less in higher intensity, relative intensity, then I don't think it's a problem. Now, mind you, like let me, let me just make something clear so, so we're not misunderstood here. I think, especially for an uh, advanced intermediate and advanced athlete, there is something special about low RAR training something that really signals satellite cell proliferation, something that really, really hints at hypertrophy at a deeper level, something that makes real big changes. And I think just doing real, a lot of submaximal volume at some point for the very advanced simply doesn't work. Like you have to use these intensity techniques. I do think there is a time for using the easier stuff. As you work through your mesocycles and through your career, you have to start trending more towards using the higher intensity, relative higher relative intensity stuff. There's no way around that, I don't think. Um, that being said, if the whole range is productive, and we have to use the whole range. So if someone comes in and you're microcycle one doing RAR four, and someone's like, "You're not training hard enough," they're wrong. And if someone catches you on microcycle number five before you deload doing RAR one grinders and says you're training too hard, they're wrong. <laughs> Right. Uh, it has to be the whole range all the way through is best for overall growth. And I think that if you're more of a beginner, you can get away with never coming up to the top end of that range. If you're more advanced, you're going to you're going to have to you're going to have to fucking push it, man. Um, mm -hmm. After your quads are enormous, they do not just grow from sets of 225. They just don't. So you got to have to do something special to them and probably push them really, really hard. And I think um, actually something we discussed recently in our uh, kind of client group was the fact that even a three rep in reserve, like that's not easy training. That's no. hard. It's really hard. And the thing is with three reps in reserve, also there's the multiplier effect of how hard volume really is. You look at three reps in reserve workout and you're like, whatever. But you see that it's three reps in reserve high bar squat. And you're like, oh, okay, that sucks. And then it's four sets at a heavyweight three reps in a reserve and then three sets at a lighter weight three reps in a reserve you're like oh my god and these are eight eight to twelve rep sets you just have a really hard workout on your hands and that's just squats you got to do some like good mornings or something after that or some hamstring curls so it's a lot of work it's a lot of stuff 
And I think there's this, um, this is where I think some psychology comes into play, where people really like, especially young men in their teens and 20s, really like to push it. They really like to know they've worked out. They like to show off. They like to hit PRs. So they like that low RAR training. But a lot of bodybuilders, especially the older ones, have discovered that you just keep it a little on the easier side and do more work, which sucks. You get really similar results, except a fraction of the injury rate risk. And is it as exciting to train on that other end? No. Yep. Is it literally more work? Yes. Does it take more time? Yes. Do you get to wag your ego around? No. But that's what it takes. Um, I wish training could be boiled down to one super duper hard set, but we already tried that with hit training. Yeah. That should no, brilliant. I think I think we've covered it really, really well, um, and I'm glad we did because um, that brought out some oh, flushed out some stuff um, that I wanted to flush out. So that was really nice. Uh, I don't think um, we've got any. Well, we've we've kept you long enough, Mike. I will let you go now. Um, and is there anything that's happening over the next kind of months that you want to let people know about? You've been doing, I mean, a ton of seminars. Um, we are currently working on our UK tour, uh, which yeah. people can start getting excited about. That'll be in July. That'll be really sweet. Um, we will be the RP crew, myself, Dr. Um, James Hoffman, Dr. Melissa Davis, will be in Finland first last weekend of March, first weekend of April. Um, we will be in Austria the weekend after that, April 7th-ish. And we will be in Ireland um, on the 14th. Um, and... Uh, if you are in any of those places are really close, um, if you're curious, hit me up uh, on Facebook or something, and I will send you details uh, of that stuff. And it's going to be really, really in-depth seminars. Fuck, in Austria, I'm speaking for like eight hours or something. Wow. Me. Cool. Yeah. So I'm just like busy making presentations now to actually have that much to talk about. You know me well enough to know I have more than fucking eight hours of shit to talk about. I just hope people don't get bored as fuck. Um, and or they like swearing because if they don't like swearing, it's eight hours is really boring shit. Um, so yeah, that's that's what's on the agenda relatively soon. Um, myself and Jared Feather actually in uh, March seventeenth, we're going to be going to Hong Kong. That's amazing. Yeah, it's fun because it's a weekend trip to Hong Kong. So uh, <laughs> we're in Hong Kong just about as long as the flights are. <laughs> oh damn. <laughs> That's the business of my life. <laughs> exactly, right? Yeah, who gives a shit about time zones? I mean, I literally have no idea what time it is at any point in that trip. I'm just not even going to be looking at clocks. I'm just going to show up to the seminar when, when I have to and when we have to to give the lectures. And we're going to train when we're not tired, and when we're tired, we're going to sleep. And is, I don't care what time it is. No, I mean, not only I have to say that's amazing, Mike, from going from uh, back, way back when, when we brought you to London years ago, and now you're, I mean, literally touring the world. That's It's just fantastic to see, and I'm so happy to see that happening because um, I have to say, if people are thinking about, if, if you are near to any of the, these locations, um, if you're thinking about it, just do it because the kind of, the quality of content is fantastic. Even going back and thinking back to the first one we ran, um, it was it, people will not get bored the entire day it was just amazing um so yeah people should definitely check those out well thanks so much steve and also just uh, just to kind of remind people um in seminars myself and all of my colleagues steve included you know, we answer pretty much all the personal questions you can ask us and you know when everyone goes to lunch we usually just get lunch brought to us so that we can continue to answer questions while eating our food um, and it's all about, I always make a lot of time for Q and A at these seminars because fundamentally you can hear some of the stuff on YouTube anyway. Um, and certainly on your podcasts, but, uh, but you don't really ever get to ask at interactive questions, like ask a question, like you asked me a question through this podcast, you get an answer, but you might be like, ah, but what I really meant was, well, sorry, there's a question. Uh, but interactive questions is just something you can't really do outside of that situation. So mm -hmm. give it some thought. Yeah, I have to I absolutely agree with that. I remember some of the discussions that we had is like groups when we did that private training session. They're just something you just don't get. Um, and that's not just to say it's special to you guys. Like it's just the same whenever you go to seminars. So um, no, that's a fantastic opportunity and I'm glad you're doing it. And again, thank you for coming on. Thank you for everyone for your questions and we will catch you shortly. Take care, folks.